So, Doc, am I going to be okay? Yes, yes, you'll be fine. Try not to take a hit like that again. You gave yourself a concussion, and one more like that, and maybe you won't be walking around so easily next time. You told me that somebody assaulted you? Yes, in the storage room. Hmm, I see. I think it's best we get somebody involved in the matter. Give me one moment. And there's some time spent waiting. And after maybe ten minutes, two sets of footsteps start coming back. The door opens. All right, we have here the assistant to the captain. The captain is unavailable due to pressing matters regarding the saturation. I do need this office in case of an emergency, but I'll leave you two together. Thanks. So, I heard about this altercation that you had. Apparently, you've tried to assault one of the passengers. You've got it wrong. I went down to the cargo hold to get some of my belongings. As you know, is allowed to us of the first class quarters. I went down there and I saw a pile of slow ether bottles and a man rummaging around my belongings. Hmm. Would you describe this man? Yes. He was a half-orc. He didn't look all too well. He might have seen some bandages on his chest, I don't know. I got a, got a good look at him. And as soon as he saw me, well, I think he didn't like that. I think he noticed I was catching him in the act. So he rushed me. He even took my gun, wrestled it from me. I tried to defend myself, but he overpowered me. He seems like he's trained. I don't know. I see. You realize what you're saying here. You're accusing. Yes. I think he still has my gun, too. Oh, well, we can't have that. A weapon like that around the ship shouldn't have been here to begin with. Yes, yes, I brought it for protection, and... I'll be sure to straighten this one out. Again, as I tend to do for everybody on this ship. Have a good day. Esper, you're in the seating area of your first-class section of the ship. Everybody seems to be standing, mingling, talking, and you notice an air of concern. You hear, overhear some conversations. Your handler, he too seems to be pacing about. He looks quite nervous. After some time of looking at Mr. Augie and his clear contempt and upset, she is eventually going to get up and walk. And as she's walking past the handler, she'll say, promise I'll come back. It's not like I can really go my very far. And she's going to move out of the area and she's going to make her way up towards the captain's quarters. As if she didn't take a moment to even consider it and just immediately decided she'll do it. She's going to brave the outside for a few seconds. You go up to the door that leads outside and step outside and it closes behind you. As you step out, you notice something different, even different from the dream you had. The air feels acidic, sharp. It's heavy in your lungs with the short breath you do, you do take, and you can tell immediately because it stings from the inside that if you breathe this too much, you could die. So as you get outside, you quickly go to the next door, open it up, and step inside. You head up the stairs and to the door. You get up there, and you see the captain through the porthole of the door commanding the ship. You see just some assistants and some guards standing inside as well. What do you do? She is going to just start knocking on the window. Somebody let that person in. 
Also, I thought we had somebody who used to stand out there and screen guests at the deck. Uh, I don't know. Never mind. And he goes over himself and opens the door. Apparently, I'm the one who is handling all of our guests now. How can I help you, miss? Captain, there's something something very wrong with this saturation. Yes, it's come early. I, I'm going to finish an announcement with instructions for the guests, but you're not to be outside in the open air. I, I know, but... When when it does come, is it it is is it especially thick? Is it does it does it tend to s- sweep on the mainland? Can you roll a, a just a charisma check, General? It is a nine. You see him sigh. Come in. He walks across to the big windows. I've been sailing this ship for my entire life. I started as a deckhand, and I inherited command from my father. And I've sailed through the saturation many times now. Don't get me wrong. It's treacherous and dangerous, but we've handled it many years in a row and we'll handle it again. You'll get there safely. I'm not trying to doubt your ability to captain the ship. I have a feeling. And I know that sounds a little weird because feelings don't mean much, but it's strong. I think we might be sailing into a ghost town. A ghost town. Have you, you've never been to Crow Perch, have you? No. Port Hillcrest is, though smaller than it once was, it's a beautiful town. There's plenty to do, there's plenty of people, and I came from there to the port where we've retrieved you just a week and a half ago. Everybody was there. Everybody will be there. And why don't you just uh, go have a drink at the bar, miss, and stop worrying so much. Her face kind of twists up, and she looks like she's repeatedly trying to start saying something. You see his eyes look over to the two guards for a moment, just kind of giving a nonverbal cue and then looking down at you, and he continues nodding and listening intently. Fine. Fine, if you think you fucking know better. And she'll turn on her heel, and she'll kind of do the underneath squeeze because of her height. Just push past the two guards. Hey, and as the captain says that, one of the guards grabs your arm. I just want to make sure that you're going to be okay. You seem distressed. Why don't I take you over to the sitting area of the second-class cabin, sit you down, give you a meal, and then send you back. What did you say your name was? Esper. Esper. Uh, Give give me Esper, please. Um, First-class cabin, uh, riding with a... uh, Names crossed out here, but a handler. They don't need to come. All right. Doesn't matter. We'll get you back to the first class cabin afterward. Let's get you a meal, get you comfortable. I have to make an announcement and we'll go from there. All right. All right. Go on and take her down. Get her uh, my menu. You sure? We only pack a limited amount of those. Just get get her what I ask, please. And uh, the guard lets go of your arm and steps in front of you to lead the way. He walks down the stairs and down the hall, and as they're walking, Dr. Glass and Trevor, you're just about to get to Dr. Glass's room as you see a guard walk by with Esper at the tail. Now, Trevor, that might not mean anything to you, but Dr. Glass, you would recognize Esper. They walk by, and you see the galley where the second-class crew can sit and eat. You see her led to a table there. Is there some place private I could pull Trevor into to speak with him secretly for a moment? Your room is private. All right, then. uh, And we're almost there, right? I would say so. And I would also say at this point, Nihilus, uh, you're probably back there as well, given the state of things outside. 
he is inside the room as the others would uh, approach uh, even through the doors you would start to hear the end of uh, a prayer uh, dear divine guide as we sail through these heavy mists we entrust our voyage into your steady hands illuminate our path with your unwavering light so that we may navigate the unknown with courage and faith amen Dr. Glass sighs at the doorway, says, oh, we are going to have to get rid of Father Pretty Boy for a few minutes, because I have some things to tell you, Trevor. But this first part, I think you'll just have to see. Come on in. And she opens, and as she's opening the door, she knocks on it and says, knock, knock, and then goes in without pausing. Come in. How did it go? All right. Thank you. It could have gone worse. It could have been more fruitful. We seem to be all right for the moment, but we don't have a lot of information further on the saturation, I'm afraid. But first things first, Trevor, give me that thing. And she gestures for the gun. You still have it in your... For the moment. I And Trevor, sorry about that, Trevor. I didn't want you to be contradicting yourself in front of them, and I think the more we keep you out of this, the better I didn't like the way he was treating you, frankly. And she, pointing the gun away from them all, she uh, tries to empty it of bullets. You do so. It's fully loaded. And as you get rid of each bullet, it's a revolver style. Um, what do you do with them? She puts the bullets in her pocket. Uh, okay. She says to the others, I'm going to plant this someplace where it can just be found. So hopefully... All our stories are corroborated, and uh, we can convince them that this idiot just lost his gun and then lashed out. That was that was way better than my plan. What was your plan, pray tell? Well, I'd like to hear it. Go to Mr. Gray and uh, threaten him with a gun. My plan, I do believe, is better for the moment, but I like how you think, and uh, this will play into that conversation I wanted to have with you. On that note... Good father, brother, whatever we're supposed to call you. Uh, um, I'm an inquisitor. Oh. Um, although, shall I step out of the room? You must be a mind reader as well, because that's just what I was going to ask. Right. I do hope that both of you know what you're getting yourselves up into. Um, well, what fun would that be, inquisitor? All right. All right, uh, let me get my things. I'll be back later. And once he's gone, she says, Good, good, that was an improvement. He's learning. Now, Trevor, you've never inquired too much into exactly what I do, other than, you know, see my patients and all of that. You seem to have an awareness, though, that I am unusually talented, let's say. I mean, yeah, sure, I, I see you talking with uh, co colleagues uh, I mean it, it's big words so I'm assuming it's important yes uh, I did want to take a moment now to share something with you that I think will help us and I don't want you to be alarmed when I do uh, so have whatever reaction you want right now while it's just the two of us and Oh no, I am a bit on the curious type. But would you, just just to rest my mind, would you mind if I take a look at the equipment itself? I'm utterly curious, purely professionalism. She kind of nods to Trevor. Like she says, yes, yes, of course, come in. And then kind of nods to Trevor, indicating that he should get between him and the door, between Nihilus and the door, just to block the path. I suppose you can look at it, but uh, then it's best for you for you both, that you not know what I do with it, so... Right. I will have you hand it back to me right away. But if there's any uh, I insights you can give us about it... Um... Of course, this is merely of a theoretical interest. And he, uh, as he puts his hand on the weapon and inspects it thoroughly, or cast, identify on it. It's going to give you a slew of information, that's for sure. But it's not like traditional D&D Identify that basically reads as a textbook to the item. What you do know is the properties 
of this gun. You note that it's made with 10% gold and the rest of a hardened steel. In fact, uh, your identify would tag that the steel has been treated, breamed, one might say. And you're familiar with broom to some extent. It's a very expensive element that's mined in Crow Perch. Anything treated with it is typically stronger as well as resistant to corrosion. You can surmise from this information immediately that this was crafted delicately somewhere on the island of Crow Perch. The gun is still a mundane gun. It's not a magical item or an artifact of any kind. It is just a very, very fancifully made expensive piece. And that's all you can get. Very interesting motion as he does this. As it starts off as a normal inspection, slowly he starts to uh, even close his eyes and then speak about the small prayer as it's almost as if the words from the book itself start to ingrain into him and they will speak the intelligence and the information that he is receiving from this item and he says all of these properties out loud and afterwards he simply says oh heavenly protector please allow us an opportune moment to advance through this journey without any major issues without any uncertainties and after sharing that information, thank you for that. I, uh, <laughs> what can I say? The cat got the best of me. Well, I've known that cat myself, uh, so I appreciate the information. Oh, well, I'll be out of your way. No apologies for that. And a mere thank you as well. Much appreciated. As he stands before Trevor looking up. Oh, yes, uh, you can let him out now, Trevor. Sorry. Do appreciate that, good man. Just before you, Just before you walk over to let him out, you hear a knock at the door. She just bites a little, almost a show of irritation off her, on her face, just thinking, I'm never going to get to finish this conversation with Trevor. <laughs> she says, who is it? Oh, uh, hello, miss. Uh, I just wanted to come and check on things here. Um, we uh, had a chance to speak to our wonderful captive guest, uh, and it seems like we might have resolved everything. Just wanted to give a quick conversation to tidy up. Oh, and perhaps, obviously, she's not holding the gun currently. Like, she put it in her uh, pouch before opening the door. Put it in the pouch? Okay. Nihilus covers the bullets on the table with his cloak. They're in her pocket. Uh, excuse me, miss. I-, I would like to open the door and speak to you in person. Is there a reason for the delay? Is there a reason for the delay? Wow. We are bold on this ship, aren't we? And she... <laughs> That's are going to think I'm not presentable, but I'm with both of you. What is that? All right. We were doing a mere prayer. Please come in. Ah, thank you so much. Um, he opens the door and walks in. Now, again, I, I realize you're seeing far too much of me for a comfortable trip. Most of the time, guests never even get to see me. I guess that's a gift. I- I'm kidding. Um, look, uh... We have been looking for... Oh, you, sir. Uh, well, I don't have your name. I apologize. Uh, T. It starts with a T. Trevor. Yes, yes, Trevor. Um, if you don't mind, we need to talk to you in private. There seems to have been some sort of incident, which you're very well aware of, and um, I'm not qualified completely myself to resolve it. So you'll have to speak to somebody... Higher up, unfortunately. Well, you want me to say the same thing I told the captain? Yes, that would be fantastic. Just say the same thing, and hopefully this will all brush right past us. Of course, with the matter of an assault, we really can't let this thing just go away. We have to do our due diligence, report it to the authorities at Port Hillcrest. A further investigation would come into play. We like to make sure our guests are kept safe, and we severely fell short of that expectation with you despite the fact that you were somewhere you weren't supposed to be. Well, let me just say, uh, once this man came to, he had a severely differing story about the situation, which warrants some more consideration amongst the crew and those involved in investigating. I I mean, sure. You'd think this would be open and shut after he... I I don't know how these things work. Um, Sounds like his little story has spread. 
you'd best go nip that in the bud, Trevor. Just be yourself. Uh, and she takes his hand, says, we'll meet uh, for dinner and chat some more and maybe play some cards. And while she's holding his hand, she looks him right in the eyes and she speaks into his mind with her mind for the first time ever and says, this is what I wanted to show you before, Trevor. Don't be alarmed. I think we may need it. So I'm telling you now. Also, don't forget that I believe in you. You're strong in so many ways. And he gets Bardic again. Nihilus is watching them profusely stare into one another's eyes from a distance. <laughs> As he relinquishes the moment. Sure. Uh, inside the room. Uh, so if you don't mind, Trevor, there are two men in the hallway uh, who will be escorting you to a room where we will have our discussion. Sure, I'm not sure I need protecting, but all right. Go on. I'll speak briefly to uh, Dr. Glass and Mr. Von Stonen here uh, once you are on your way. They would immediately begin to lead you into the galley of the second class cabin where you walk by the same uh, person that walked by you earlier who's currently eating a very fancy meal and they walk by to a side room. It almost looks like a broom closet entrance but when they open the door you notice it's a large storage room. Inside the room. So um, I did want to speak to you both in private after Mr. Trevor here has left. This is I, about the champagne. Uh, excuse me? Captain Strand said that to, uh, you know, make up for this inconvenience putting uh, me and Mr. Van Stonen together, that uh, you were going to have some uh, of his finest champagne brought to the cabin. But it's not here yet. You don't have to roll a deception check because he is so flustered by this, this situation that he looks out and gestures to the other guard who didn't follow Trevor. Uh, yes, uh, that sounds like something the captain would have asked for. And of course, it is on its way. Please go and fetch it for us. And the other man leaves, heading to the galley and towards the kitchen. Excellent. Finally, something gets done. Well, thank you for stopping in and making sure that that got taken care of. Yes, my pleasure, but there is something else I needed to discuss. It's regarding your bodyguard, Trevor. Now, I regret to inform you that the man who was involved in this assault has created a completely separate chain of events leading up to this situation. Um, the issue is that he is a, a belowborn. Let me just put it this way. He is a very well-regarded person of a high establishment, esteem, one might say. In a situation where there are two differing sides to a story, unfortunately, it's people like Trevor who sometimes end up unfairly, I will say unfairly, in trouble. I just wanted to let you know. She looks at Nihilus, just wondering if any of that's news to him. Like, she's about to say, she's about to mock how obvious a statement that is but it says she takes it as an opportunity to learn something about Nihilus. What's his reaction to that? You would definitely recognize uh, an initial face of empathy and sadness. It's something that you can definitely notice on his face that he has seen and experienced before, although there is a slight hint of differences as he, he twists his, his eyebrow. There's, there's a slight hint of it is still something new, so... Uh, he does actually speak up and say, this man who claims to be assaulted, let me get a whole different kind of story, I suppose. Is he of a specific house? Um, you're regarding to uh, Mr. Todd Gray, the recipient of Trevor's fist. Correct, I am not familiar with... The, the gentleman, but from the way how you were speaking about him, he does seem of higher importance to Aho. I'm merely curious. Of course. 
He is a House Van Thorn. Now, if you're not familiar, which I don't blame you, the, the goings on at Crow Perch aren't the most public, especially in Port Hillcrest. It's behind the wall where most of the politics happens. House Van Thorn is one of the wealthiest houses on the island, if not the. In fact, of all houses that control power, they're one of the few to originate from Sablemere, unlike the others that have some semblance of power at Crow Perch as well. House Meridian, House Scalder, they can't hold a torch to Van Thorn in terms of power and influence. I see. The islands of Crowbush definitely has its own dynasty, in this I, I understand. Before things shoot out of hand, if a man who is part of his job is to help find solutions to delicate situations, if I might offer a different point of view, especially with adversaries that we have coming ahead and the difficulties of the task of the ship itself. I'm sure the captain doesn't want any more troubles on his hand. Seeing as Trevor has already been forced to demote to a lower class and the common rooms, might it be an easier solution that for now simply the gentlemen shall keep space from one another until the house Van Thorn shall put their own main decidement one once we reach shores, and surely then we can decide further on how to proceed. Go ahead and roll persuasion. For a total of four. You see an immense strain on his face, almost like your words are cutting into his, his day and what he intends to be doing. And he expresses, for a man of the testimonium, I see no reason why you can't be present as a spiritual guide, at least, to Mr. Trevor, uh, but I must insist that your guidance should extend only on the spiritual matters. Is that understood? As the sun itself. Wonderful. You can escort with me to Trevor's room. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Glass, what was it? Uh, this... Just this Todd Gray that is apparently so much more esteemed and regarded than myself or my friend. Uh, would he by any chance be the person who received the suite that I booked? I would have to check the records on that, Dr. Glass. It's not something I would know off the top of my head. Um, however... Oh. And if you'd like to roll an insight on that, you're more than welcome. <laughs> I would love to, yes, if I may. And that is a 25 in sight. Um, That's more like it. He genuinely seems uncertain about that matter, but upon thinking about it a bit more, he seems to have caught a thought uh, mid-sentence that changed his mind. And that's what led to him saying, actually, no, he's not the one. That does imply to you that he does know the one. And who would it be that I might... Uh, Approach him and make sure he knows there are no hard feelings, that it's not his fault that the staff overbooked. I... I would certainly love to give you that information, Dr. Glass. However, you must understand it's policy to not share the personal information about those who are traveling with us, especially those in the first-class cabins. What class are we in, by the way, Wes? You're in the second class. You did book a first class cabin. You got to a second class room, and then they also said that Trevor wasn't going to be able to stay. So, of course, yeah. There is a, a chain of demotions of living accommodations that has happened here. Oh, yes. And just finally, uh, poor Trevor, as you could probably tell, he is such a sweet soul. Whom is it that he needs to convince of the correct story? Is there a tribunal, or what? Is he in the brig? There's no brig. Uh, he will be returning to his sleeping accommodations as long as everything goes smoothly. May I make a suggestion? Are you making a suggestion, or just a suggestion? Capital S. Okay, you can make a suggestion. No, she is casting suggestion. She says, may I make a suggestion? Also, she is casting suggestion. That's a save. 
what is his save amount? Uh, it's actually only 13 right now. My spell save. Wisdom, yeah. But if he fails, he doesn't know that I was trying to cast this. You see his eyes, and they look into yours. They sink into your eyes, and for a moment you see his eyes dilate, and he seems open to your suggestion. Yes, what kind of suggestion did you have in mind? Now, Dr. Glass doesn't think this guy is the decision maker, but she's seen him going all here and there to and fro. So she says, this person who can uh, uh, discern things that you mentioned, I suggest you bring him here to meet me as soon as possible so I can get acquainted. Yes, I think it might be best that you just speak one-on-one. -on -one. Obviously, it has to be a private meeting. I'll see what I can do right now. You're so clever and so helpful. Thank you. Is there a, a card I can fill out to, to praise your service? You know, uh, one to four. You can always send a recommendation over to the captain, and he'll be sure to reward my efforts. Now, I must be going because I, I need to arrange a meeting right now. Good lad. And without saying another word, he turns almost mechanically and walks through the door. Quite convincible, Doctor. I have my ways, and I have my ways of knowing when to use them and on whom to use them. This, that fellow is... In any event, I do have one favor to ask of you, Nihilus. Uh, just one more thing. Could you close your eyes? He grasps, grasps his book firmly, holds it tight, closes his eyes. And she casts invisibility and leaves. Nihilus, you open your eyes. Actually, we should still do it for D&D rules. Please roll a stealth check with advantage. Mm-hmm. 18. You open your eyes, Nihilus, and the room is empty. It's a hint of a smile on his face. Quite interesting, Doctor, as well. And he goes to follow where he believes Trevor would be. You walk out of the room and through the door to the galley. And again, Esper, you see now this man of God walk by and into this broom closet. Could he just... Mm -hmm. As all of this has been going on, anybody who happens to see this halfling at this big table getting served the finest of cuisine on this ship would probably notice that Esper seems incredibly uneasy and looking around. She has particular interest in where the gigantic man went, but also Esper can't quite stop herself from taking advantage of just how fancy her meal is. And you can occasionally see her very happily using these, what for her are big forks and knives, cutting daintily into this bread and taking a quick little bite and basically hamming up this meal as much as she can. She is watching all of you, except for Dr. Glass, because she can't see her, approach this door. As you walk in, Trevor, I'm going just a moment back. There are a couple of workers in the room who seem to be talking, and they don't pay much mind originally because this room is one that's used by a lot of different people, even some uh, passengers, you know, who know the crew or who are freely, freely able to go about can stop in at times. So they continue leaning against the wall and talking. And as you walk in, Trevor, and sit down at the table, the guard doesn't actually follow in with you. He seems to wait outside the door. You hear, overhear this conversation. Yeah, um, they have me moving boxes once we get there. Got a bad back. It's really something I've been asking them not to do. Listen, just move a box, one box, a small one, put it down, go take a smoke break. We have unions for a reason. All right, take your time and just, just fly under the radar. It's worth, it's easier than actually having to address it with somebody higher up. I don't know, ma'am. This job wasn't supposed to be so hard. 
Sorry, what was you talking about? Uh, boxes just leaving them? I've got a bad back. And when they ask me to move boxes, I... I could just throw it out. Then I'm out of work for months. What was the point then? I'm not getting paid, and I hurt myself. I'm sorry to hear that, man. Yeah. Yeah, you... I mean, honestly, I, I'm barely a passenger. You know, they they got me down in the common area. They got me. Uh, I mean, really, I'm only here on behalf of someone I work for. So really, I'm just an employee like you. Man, I like this guy. Yeah, look, we got to We got to get back. Well, all right. Hey, what was your name again? Uh, my name. My name's Trevor. Trevor. I'm going to call you Trev. I like you, man. He walks out of the door. How's Gaspard, right? Yeah, they do most of the work anyway. You just have to stand around, is what I'm told. But if you're removing boxes too, doing my part, it'll look good. Sounds good. Hey, hey, what's your name, man? Ken. I'm gonna call you Ken. Thanks, man. And he steps out. (laughs) As he walks out, Nihilus Von Stonen walks in. God bless you, Tussaud. Of course. You step in, you see Trevor sitting at the table, and we'll say some time goes by. At this point, the movement to and from this broom closet has slowed down. Esper, you've gone through several courses of meals. She is enjoying most of it. The pasta in particular, it was good, and yet at the same time, it seemed like she had a little bit of difficulty getting used to that slight funk. But all the same, there's those moments of her in clear enjoyment of being fancy for a little bit while she watches the commotion at the door. Dr. Glass, you turned invisible. Where did you go? Shout out to the savvy listeners. I have realized that I didn't just cast two concentration spells in a row. Perhaps I throw myself upon the mercy of the DM for first session jitters and perhaps that attendant Uh, fulfilled my suggestion really, really fast. You cast invisibility, and you're a savvy mind, heavily trained, and you notice, maybe in hindsight, that your focus is starting to become a bit divided. Now, you're invisible for the time, but you're having a lot of trouble straining on both at the same time. You'd have to choose after some time, let's say five minutes or so, Great. Thank you. Uh, And yes, I would rather take a penalty than have our listeners think I don't understand concentration. Uh, But uh, I don't need to be invisible long. So she's just going to look around for uh, someone who looks like a real narc. Uh, A staff member who would uh, find a gun and immediately deliver it to the captain. Okay. Um... Not that same attendant, because there's been too much face time. Of course. I would say go ahead and roll investigation. Seven. Um, it's hard to find anybody, really. Uh, the crew seems to be preoccupied. It's almost a ghost town. You just see passengers and those who are involved in this is- incident. But after going down some of the doors, you notice one of them isn't a cabin for quarters, but instead looks a bit like an office. And in the room, you see a dwarvish man, his head hunched over a table, writing frantically something. And on the wall, you see a calendar, you see uh, some calculating devices. You can tell this person seems like a numbers guy. Nice. All right, then... I can't cast another spell while I'm doing this, certainly. Uh, She's going to place the gun quietly on the ground, like right in front of the doorway. And then she's going to step away from the doorway, 30 feet away. And she's going to drop invisibility and her her spectral shadowy hand uh, is going to just push the door open a bit so it creaks and catches his attention. Oh. Hey. You hear a creak of the chair dragging across the floor and some footsteps. What's this? 
and you hear the gun being picked up off the ground, and you hear the door close again. She makes a note of where this room is. She's going to hope that that worked and that that was the right person to do that with. Uh, and then she's going to look for a portal or something that can ac- or a door that can access the outside. Through, in this case, all of the doors of the sleeping quarters of the second class cabins connect through the galley to the outer second class deck. You could also go back around the stairwell and make your way down and out to the commoner's deck. I think uh, while invisible, that would be too noticeable and memorable, especially be being loud on the stairs. So it's that I just have to go through the galley to get to it. Yes, you'd go through the galley, and you know you'd be passing Esper, and that's really the only person besides the guard who's there. On this on this level? That's fine. That's perfect, then. Uh, she's going to go into the galley uh, and have a seat. Okay. You step into the galley, and you sit down at one of the tables. Esper is located actually right next to the door. That's where her table is. There's another one that's just across the room. And awkwardly, of course, the guard stands watch right outside of the door with his hands crossed in quite a typical fashion. As you sit down, you see Esper. Esper, you see Dr. Glass. Dr. Glass observes her. Hopefully her expression is difficult to read, as it often is, just impassively. She wonders if Esperanza knows who she is, knows that she's, that Dr. Glass is, you know, uh, written about her uh, a million years ago. Just wondering why she is here, and with everything else happening, she's a little concerned that someone like Esper is on this ship. Esper is like sitting there, like mid chew, cocking her head to the side at this woman who's staring at her. And after a while, her eyes drift to the door that Trevor was put behind as well, and then back, and it's kind of a, a bit of a back and forth. The guard looks just ever so briefly at the two of you, opens the door and walks in and looks over at Trevor. I don't know. They seem like they might know each other, might not. I felt kind of awkward. I'm going to stand in here for a bit. He gets the the chair, pulls it out, sits in front of you, pulls out a deck of cards and puts it on the table. Fancy a game. Esper and Dr. Glass, you're both alone in the room. Evening, dear. Can, can I help you? Oh, it just seemed awkward, you know. The two of us in this big empty hall. Not, well, I just wanted to be neighborly. Sorry if I did it wrong. Sometimes I have a little bit of an unnerving effect on people at first, but... Bread? Oh, yes, thank you. I'm starving. No, yeah, I mean, it's pretty good. And she's putting another silver food in her mouth. I just had to just had to annoy somebody enough, and then I decided that we're going to give me a captain's dinner. Oh, this is this is pretty good, actually. Very good. Yeah. Uh, maybe one day I'll try something like that. Say, um, you don't happen to be uh, a local to to the island, do you? No, no. I went once as a little girl with my family, but not a native at all. Why do you ask? Something is bothering me about this this mist, this this saturation. I I don't know enough about it myself to really be able to say, but I, I get the feeling I get the feeling something's a little wrong about it, you know, when you just get a feeling. I do know. Oh. You're very wise to pay attention to those feelings. So many people will tell us to ignore them. Captain could learn a thing or two from you. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one thinking it. You spoke with the captain? Mm. Yeah, I... Another piece of bread tears a chunk off. I went to go and try and tell him about it. I thought if anybody, he would know, you know? So maybe he'd be able to hear me out a little bit, but uh, I guess... I, I guess he wasn't really interested. It might have just been that he has no idea what to do and he's scared shitless. Not a good thing for a captain to be a pope. No. I don't think anything about this is good. They said it was coming early, but I don't know, isn't that, isn't that like really, not even strange, but just like really bad? Yes. 
It's bad for many people, just unto itself. Certainly for those who didn't want to spend that much time on the island. Actually, for me, it might be wonderful. Uh, they told me that they were going to pay for my lodgings on shore because of a, a mix-up, but I don't think they knew when they said that how long it was going to be. Get what you can when you can get it. Yes, but that's not what you're asking. I apologize for joking. Oh, don't, don't worry about that. Uh, it's a little calming, I guess. It's a distraction from the worry. And from bad dreams, maybe? I mean, you can't, you can't really do much with a dream. I wouldn't know, but I suspect otherwise. I'm so sorry I haven't introduced myself. Dr. Isadora Glass. Oh, a, do a doctor? Yes, of the mind and its ailments. Hold her hand out for a shake after she dusts breadcrumbs off of this. She takes it, presses it, even. Esper's grip itself is also quite strong, even if it is small. I think you maybe do hear a little crack of knuckles. I know it's a little rude, but I have a question, and I'm not going to be able to really rest easy, at least until I ask it. Go right ahead. Do you happen to know somebody named Dr. Faust? Uh, Wes, I assume I've heard of Dr. Faust, but I mean, or maybe not. I I don't think she knows him, but... Yeah, Doc, Dr. Faust is not somebody you might have met directly, but you would have heard his name. Well regarded amongst the industry, but also well rumored to be well regarded for reasons that aren't related to his work. Definitely he moves up the chain because of his background and status more so than his success. And he has rumors of way over medicating his patients um, to a dangerous level at times. That's what I thought. I've heard of him. I don't know him personally. Our, uh, our work has intersected, I suppose, depending on how you want to look at it. I disagree with some of his methods, surely, but then people disagree with mine. Why do you ask? It's It's been a, a sprung upon me, I guess you could say, that I'm going to have to give him a visit when we dock, and I don't want to. Who's telling you you have to? Dr. Faust himself, I think. I think he stepped in, and I'm going to have to see him to get what I'm actually going to the island for. Is there any advice you might be able to give me to tell him enough of what he wants to hear to be able to say that I can go and get what I'm after? Which is just mostly uh, away from him. Ah. Uh, yes, I might be able to help with that, actually. I'm all ears. Here, have some tea. Why, thank you. I don't know him personally, but I know his type. Is there anything we can put in this? She just looks around for alcohol. But there's no one here but us, so she just sips her tea. These types, they want to give you medication. They don't want to argue. They want you to be normal. Your best bet, if you're on your own, is to act grateful to see him for his time. Don't argue with him. She catches herself for a second. I wonder if you've been prescribed medications in the past, perhaps the kind that make you sleepy and numb. The ethers, not quick ether, obviously. Xynoquil, perhaps. Dr. Glass is asking some very pointed questions at Esper. Can Esper attempt to glean anything off of that? I think so. I'd say if you want to roll an insight check, I can give you some details. As a five. You, you don't catch anything in particular, but with a five, you at least can tell that Dr. Glass seems to know something more than the average person. And while you're having this chat, you begin to hear footsteps, two pairs, coming down the hallway where your room is. Followed by a stop, a door opening and closing, and then one set of footsteps 
heading towards the galley. The footsteps stop, and the door to the galley opens. In walks the assistant to the captain. Ah, uh, oh, there you are. Um, the person you were looking to speak to, I have left in your room. Uh, they're there, prepared to have the conversation. Uh, we just... They'll be waiting for you, but not for long. They obviously are busy people. Not busy peeping, I hope. No, uh, somebody of this caliber has no interest in any belongings of yours, believe me. Wonderful. I planned this out so, so well, didn't I? Uh, uh, and the champagne, is it in there as well? Yes, as a matter of fact, it is. I left it there on a table uh, set for uh, yourself, and I, I did provide an extra glass in case you wanted to share it with your guest. All right, my, my roommate might also want some when he returns, but that's fine. Uh, don't bring us another glass. You can leave us for the evening. Wonderful. Uh, I do have to go and speak to uh, our friend Trevor. I'll try to be quick about that. Gives a polite nod of the head and walks into the room where Trevor is. Now, uh, Mr. Trevor, I see you have a wonderful game of cards going. I must ask that it stop so we can get through our matters here today. I was going easy on you because I wanted to, uh, you know, really spring a trap, but uh, apparently that's not going to happen. Sorry, bud. So, uh, you win. Congrats. Uh, no, no, it's, it's a draw. He stands up. He's already feeling more friendly towards you. And he stands up back to his professional job at the door. The assistant of the captain sits. So, Trevor, I might have put this on to be more than it actually is. The person you've interacted with has a great deal of power. And unfortunately, it means once we arrive at Port Hillcrest, you're going to be under a great deal of scrutiny. I don't know exactly what that's going to end in, but I was to have a more detailed meeting here with you. I find no reason for it. Just suffice it to say, be prepared to speak to the powers that be once we land. All right, fine. Uh, I, I don't feel like I'd been the wrong, so I just tell him what I did and that should be fine, right? Yeah. You see a, a look on his face of deep concern and he stands up and gives you a half-hearted smile and leaves the room. And before he completely leaves, he ducks back in for a moment. Uh, if you'll give this room over to the guards, they'll arrange everything for you. It should only take but a few hours. We have extra of everything in storage. Great, great. Don't mind me if I indulge. Of course. Safe travels. Dr. Glass, in the meantime, while this was happening, you had a guest waiting for you. Yes, and I think she needs to do that next. Uh, does, but does she see the attendant leave? She realizes now where Trevor is and that he's just in there. I would say this is happening simultaneously. So you're on your own for the next 10 to 20 minutes. And I don't think your guest would wait that long. Okay. Almost as soon as the attendant is gone, she's going to stand and maybe make a little bit more of difficulty than she needs to. Says, well, uh, you heard the man. I have to go see some guest who's probably rifling through my underthings as we speak. Uh, but come see me. And she writes down her cabin number. Uh, anytime, knock first. I've got an unfortunate roommate. And we can discuss this more. I would very much like to get to know you better, Esperanza. She does not clock that... I don't believe Esperanza actually said her name. Uh... No, she didn't say her name. Uh, I don't know if Esper clocks that. I'll roll for it. I roll a natural 20 on a perception, if that's okay. For Esper to realize that Dr. Glass knows her name without Esper having to say it. Dr. Glass gets up, and she goes and walks in the wrong direction to the door to the outside, and opens it, and gets, like, a face full of salt, and coughs... And as she's coughing, Mage hands the bullets, like just like hurls them over the side, over the edge of the ship into the sea. And then she closes the door again. Like, oh! 
I got a bit turned around. Wrong door. Well, let's try that again, shall we? Don't, don't, don't breathe that. Yeah, that's bad. I did not enjoy that one bit. I'd better get to some of that champagne as soon as possible. Doctor's orders, if I do say so. But it was a pleasure. Thank you for the bread. Uh, yes. Uh, good, good night. Yes, good night, dear. Dr. Glass, you head towards your room. There, as you get to the door, what do you do? You haven't opened it yet. I fling it open unceremoniously without announcing myself. It's my fucking room. You do so. There's a man standing at the window, his back turned towards you, opulently dressed. You don't need him to turn around to know who he is. The scent of his cologne is already reminiscent. Besides, the back of his head, the color of his hair, everything seems to point to Lord Felix Royce. She immediately shuts the door again with herself on the outside and stands frozen, paralyzed for a moment. And she knows she can't run. There's nowhere to run to, and she also literally can't run. So she's not sure there's anything else to do. What with the display she just made? And she opens the door again. She says, My, these things are heavy. How do you do, Felix? Dr. Glass, it's good to hear your voice again. I wonder if you remember things that were saying the last time we met. How could I forget? Stop. Don't. You're mad. What are you doing to me? How could you have done this? Those fun things. Wouldn't want to make you feel uncomfortable, Dr. Glass. I hope you don't mind. I already opened your champagne. I left a glass on the table. Is it poured already, or...? It is. You see, his glass is nearly empty. The champagne bottle is sitting to the side, half empty itself, and there's an untouched glass on the table. Unless something in her mind tells her not to, she's going to use Mage Hand to grab that glass and raise a toast. Because if he wanted to kill her, he, was, he doesn't need poison. He could probably just kill her. Tears, Felix. To you. To me? Why is that? Because you weren't expecting to see me alive? Let's just say when all of noble society is aware of the famous Dr. Glass giving private sessions and asking about little old me, word gets around. Well, I, I thought you were long gone, Felix. You know I worry about you. We used to be so close. Close indeed. Is there a reason you intend to seek me? Because I'm right here. It's all the same things. We discussed last time, Felix. What you did to Avalard. What you took from him. I see. She does just, uh... She is proficient with the Poisoner's Kit, and I believe she's proficient with Champagne. So, uh, does she have an inkling of, does this look and smell normal? She's kind of just holding it. Roll Perception. Oh, it did advantage because of the Echo Light, which I don't... Oh, it was a three and a four, so... <laughs> Either eight or nine Perception. You can tell that you didn't get a good bouquet of the smells. You don't know if there's something wrong with it. You can't tell. Now, if I was going to poison you, I would do so much more eloquently, Dr. Glass, don't you think? I think if you wanted to kill me, you would have killed me in Witchvale. And she sips the champagne. I take it you don't want to reminisce. It won't make you. So instead, I'll just deliver the message that you asked for when you called for me by beguiling one of the ship's crew. If you seek me out, people will die. Some of which live peacefully on Crow Perch now. Some who don't. Don't underestimate my reach, Dr. Glass. I haven't done that in a while, but you're implying that if I do nothing, people will live. And I'm not sure I believe that, now do I, Felix? Well, then let me narrow the scope. Do you recall a notable family member not one who was involved in the Circle of Whispers, but perhaps should have been. My family? Not my family. What are you... what are you on about, Felix? They've been 
Well, let's say that they've been seen by doctors. Their condition in talking about some grand entity that communicates with them doesn't come across well to traditional medicine. I know. They're safe, of course. They're alive. She's alive. I haven't seen... You know that I haven't seen her since I was a girl. Let's just say, if a reunion is in order, it's in your best interest that her doctors do not consider her a danger to others, given her extreme levels of psychosis. And she puts... Her mage hand puts the glass down, and she clutches the head of the cane and takes just a few steps towards him. Why did you do all this, Felix? What does it get you? I still don't understand how I could have been so wrong about you. In due time, Doctor, it's a small island. People talk, and he begins to walk past you, brushing your shoulder just slightly as he walks towards the door and puts his handle on the doorknob and turns back to you. Oh, and Dr. Glass, you're going to need to do better than Trevor if you're going to try to protect yourself from me. Leave him out of this. He doesn't know anything. Anyway... Ta-ta. And he opens the door and walks out into the hall. Did you steal my sweet, you brat? And she throws his champagne glass at the door with her main hand. And that's a great place to end today's session.